Well, good morning, church. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I am here at the church with instruments behind me, but no musicians, and there's a lot of empty green chairs. Uh, but I hope you're comfortable. Uh, this building isn't the same, obviously, without you all, and it makes me realize, and hopefully you too, just how privileged we have been together, together each week to enjoy worshipping together and fellowship together. But I trust last week you were encouraged by both of the sermons and I have been hoping and praying that the same would be for this morning and tonight's sermon too. Uh, but this morning we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, focusing on verses 3 to 5, but we'll start in verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, so I'll give you a chance just to open up there uh, if you've got it on your phone or if you've got an actual Bible in front of you, but it'll be helpful for you to see these verses. So chapter 1 of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, reads this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect strangers in the world scattered throughout Pontus Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who've been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. Verse 3 Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. It's kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. Let me pray uh, before we jump in. Heavenly Father, we, uh, even now as we're not together, I just pray that you would uh, truly be with us in some sense. Would you knit us together to hear your word? We thank you for your word and we pray that you would be sending it straight into the depths of our hearts. Uh, for those who are from our church at Castle Hill or others who might be listening and watching in, I pray that you would uh, attach your blessing to the preaching of your word. We can't gather, but Lord, we know you are always with us and we thank you that your word is living and active. And so we pray in all of this, send it into our hearts and glorify your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to see wondrous things concerning him and all that you have done. May you be praised in this time, we ask. Amen. Well, just a little bit of context here. Uh, Peter is writing to Christians uh, who are persecuted they're suffering, they're displaced, uh, they're really in crisis. But instead of panicking, instead of losing hope, instead of freaking out, he actually calls them to praise. And he says there in verse 3, you'll notice, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now for us, we... We aren't really facing this persecution that Peter's talking about here and the same trials, but uh, in a sense, we are in crisis. And yet Peter calls for praise. He, he sends up praise to God. Why? Well, there's a few things I want us to see in these verses. Firstly, praise for the mercy of a new birth date. Praise for the mercy of a new birth date. In verse 3, he says there, after he's praised to God, in his great mercy. Peter jumps to God's mercy here. And mercy in the New Testament, in the salvation context, is God looking at sinners who are helpless, who are hopeless, and who are in a wretched condition. And God is in, from himself moved with pity, and he shows them compassion. So, so God's mercy is him lifting up the sinner out of the mire, and uniting them to Christ, and they share in this glory. So it's really a tale of from rags to riches. But notice what this mercy, this great mercy involves. Verse 3, in his great mercy, he has given us new birth. This is to be born again. That's what 
Peter's talking about here. And this is exactly what Jesus taught to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. What is this new birth? Well, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 36, the prophets of old spoke about this work and they describe it as having our old heart that was non-responsive to God taken out and a new one put in. They speak of God putting his spirit within us. They speak of a recreation happening from the inside. Why is it necessary for a person to be born again? Well, you read the scriptures. This recreation is so necessary because you read the scriptures and it describes humanity's condition, you and me. Isaiah 1.6 says, From the top of your head to the sole of your foot, there is no soundness in your body, just wounds, welts, and open sores. What a description. Jeremiah 13.23 says this, Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Or can the leopard change his spots? The answer is no. And then he says, Neither can you do good who are accustomed to evil. In the New Testament, Romans 3, there is no one who is good, no, not one. And then the sinking blow that stops us. He says this, together we have all become worthless. Worthless. You see, This is our condition. This is the human condition. So when you have people who rage at Christianity, those who want to continue, for example, practicing homosexuality, and they rage at Christians and say, I can't help it. I was born that way. Well, what do we say? The Bible says you must be born again. Or it could be anything, the person, the man, the woman who is full of anger, who is quick-tempered, who is always full of rage, and they want to defend themselves and say, well, I can't help it, I was born that way. We say, well, okay, but the Bible says you need to be born again. You see, this new birth from God, it's not just a little reformation or a turning over a new leaf, it's the implanting of a new life in a spiritual corpse. Paul says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And when God, when God recreates a person, he is demonstrating and displaying greater power in that moment than the power he exerted when he created the universe back in Genesis 1. How is that? Well, he created this world out of nothing. From nothing, he made something good. But when God recreates, does a a work of creation in the sinner, he takes someone who was God-hating, sin-loving, Satan-following, and he takes that creature and he turns them into a worshiper, an adorer of God. Someone who is even willing to lay down their life as a martyr for him, if need be. Friends, the, the new birth that is spoken of here, it is an unfathomable gift that we have received. Think about it. What did you receive from your first birth? What, what, were you, what were you brought into through your first birth? Are you not, based upon that birth, brought into a world full of misery and trouble? Our first birth, what did it bring us into? What kind of world is this? We live in a world where some parents have to bury their children, where women send their husbands and their sons off to war, where people are purchased as sex slaves, as you would purchase something from the shop, so too are people purchased for such acts as that. We live in a world where the rich flourish in mansions and the poor are left to die in the street like dogs. Starvation. And we live in a world where it's unsafe to leave your doors unlocked. And and Jeremiah knew that his first birth brought him into all of this. The prophet Jeremiah says this in 2014. Cursed be the day I was born. May that day, the day my mother bore me, not be blessed. He's saying, don't celebrate my birthday. And he says, why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow and to end my days in shame? Friends, did Did our first birth, did it only bring us into a world of misery? No, but more and but worse. 
We are born mortal, the, the clock is ticking against us. And worse than that, we're born with a sinful nature. Every single child, every person born into this world, unable to see the truth, unable to receive it. We are born loving sin, bound to it, married to it, infatuated to it. We are born hostile to God. Jesus says there are two roads, the broad way that leads to hell and the narrow way that leads to eternal life. Every person born into this world is born onto the broad way. From the moment of conception, from your birth, you receive a one-way ticket to hell. This was our first birth, but Peter says, In his great mercy, he has given us new birth. How much greater is it? Our first birth, we were born as children of the devil. Our second birth, we are born as sons of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. How much greater? The first birth, we're born according to the flesh. The second, we're born according to the Spirit. We, You and I, we have annual celebrations for our birthday and 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 peter says we we should be praising god and celebrating our second birth date what did jesus say jesus said there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner that repents there is celebration when that new birth happens for me i was born in september 89 but i was born again in august 09 now, I'm thankful for the day that I was born, and birthday parties are nice, but I get, I get nowhere near as much joy when someone throws a birthday party for me as the joy that I get when I get to share with people my testimony, the story of how God brought about my second birth. You can't compare the joy between the two. Now, it doesn't matter if you can't remember the date, the moment of when you were born again. That doesn't matter. As one pastor had said, you don't need a birth certificate to know that you're alive. The the date doesn't matter. All that matters is, are you born again? If you don't have the second birth, this new birth, for a person who's only born once, they will go to hell. But for the person who is born twice, who receives a new birth, Their home will be heaven. This is his great mercy that is shown to us. And you may think, well, even after the new birth and when we get this, we're still in this world of trouble and and heartache and heartbreak and sorrow and misery and violence and losing loved ones, just like when we weren't born again. True. That is true. But the new birth changes how we face these things. I want us to see next. Look. We praise God. We can praise God in the crisis because we have a living hope. Praise God for the living hope. Look at verse 3. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A living hope. Now, there's not much hope around the world today with all of this coronavirus. As you look around, there's despair, there's worry, all the things that the new birth, the first birth bring us into. There's just trouble. Why is there such little hope at the moment around the world? Why such fear? Because people are dying and more people will die and people are scared to die. But Christians, Christians possess, Peter says, a living hope back in 2015 in kenya at the garris university terrorists came in onto campus and in the morning they killed 147 students and the reports show us that these terrorists went from room to room from dorm to dorm from facility to facility and they went in and they asked these questions to the students Are you a Muslim or are you a Christian? Now for those Christians, those students who identified with Christ, they received bullets and were killed, were massacred. 
These Christians experience great evil, but what else can explain their identifying cry with Christ before these guns, but except for a living hope that was within them? What else can account for it? I want you to think about something, and, and I don't know how you'll feel about this, but think about it. At the moment, with this coronavirus, it's absolutely wreaking havoc, specifically in Italy. And as I was reading reports, doctors and nurses are faced with a moral choice that no one would have to get, want, want to receive. And doctors and nurses uh, have so many people, they have such limited resources, they are now choosing who they will put on ventilators and who they won't put on ventilators and simply give a warm blanket to die. They have to make that choice. I want to submit to you, if there is a Christian who is brought into that hospital with the coronavirus needing a ventilator, the Christian should be the first one to give up their ventilator and exchange it for a warm blanket so that someone else can be saved. Why? Why? Because we have a duty to love our neighbour? Absolutely. But why, why is this the first choice for the Christian? And the natural response, because we have a living hope. We have a living hope. Do you see what it says? He has given us new birth into a living hope. The world doesn't have this. And before we were born again, we didn't have this. We used to fear death. We used to be paralyzed, bound by anxiety, tortured by it. All of us made decisions based on self-preservation. We had no hope and we had no confidence of where we would end up once we died. Our hope was nothing more than a candle. The moment it was lit, it had an expiry date. But now, he says, we have a living hope, a lively hope that's growing it's growing every day. It's living and active. We've all seen those films before of survival where someone is stranded in a jungle or stranded in the snowy mountains or someone's stranded in the middle of the ocean and they get to a point where they've run out of resources. They can't call. They've got no SOS. They, they've got no food and they're left to a point where they're dying. They're lying on the ground. They can't move. They can't even open their eyes. They can't make a sound. But you see these movies and virtually all of them have this in common. At one point when they're at death's door, they can't move. They, they hear a boat, a rescue boat or a rescue plane come past. And what happens? The camera goes in onto that character's face and their eyes start twitching and their body starts moving, and they begin to crawl and crawl and crawl and manage to get up and somehow mutter sounds for help, pleas for help, wave their hands. What's happening? Because just a moment ago, they, they couldn't do anything. In the space of a minute, they went from hopeless to having a living hope. And Peter says, this is what the Christian has. So through suffering, through persecution, through crisis, we have this living hope that keeps us pressing on. This is what, the Peter, this is what Peter reminds these suffering Christians, these persecuted Christians. And now the question may arise, Peter, this living hope sounds wonderful, but what's it based upon? Nathan, this, this living hope, it sounds great, but... How do we get? How do we conjure it up? Do, do I feel it? Do I do I try and think positively? What's it based upon? Well, look at verse three. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, the the living hope is given to you the moment implanted, the moment you are born again. But it is based upon. It comes through. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, our hope is, is not hopeful like the world talks about being hopeful. It, it's not this blind, romantic hope. It's not a hope against all the odds. It, that, that's not what it is. Rather, it is a hope that is anchored in the most important event that happened in all of history. The rising from the dead of Jesus Christ. I've got a quote here. Edmund Clowney puts it so well. He says this, quote, Peter writes of a sure hope, a hope that holds, for, holds the future in the present because it is anchored in the past. 
Now, do you understand what he's saying here? What we're saying is we have this hope for the future that is that we can be assured of now because it is anchored in an event that happened in the past. We are hopeful of the future because of what happened in the past and we have a living hope now because, Peter says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, when, when, when Jesus died for Peter, this was the greatest tragedy because just the night before he had betrayed and denied his Lord and then the very next day his Lord dies. Things couldn't be worse than this. This is rock bottom for Peter. This is worst case scenario. But Jesus rose from the dead and he appeared again to Peter. And when Peter saw Christ, it was as if hope was reborn inside of him. He gained this living hope because he saw the living Jesus. And now here Peter wants to encourage these suffering, persecuted Christians in crisis. He wants to remind them of their living hope that is based upon the living Savior. You see, the gospel is that Jesus died as a substitute for our sin. Jesus pays the wage for sin. Because he dies for us, God can forgive us based upon the sacrificed son. He dies for us, but he rises, and he rises victoriously unto glory. But he doesn't just rise for himself. He rises for us. And because he rose, we too will rise. This is the living hope that gets implanted into Christians. This is why Christian uni students can identify with Christ when they have a machine gun pointed at their face. This is why Christians who are brought in hospital, can give up their ventilators for another and exchange it for a warm blanket of death because they have the living hope of the living Savior in them. I ask you, CHBC or listener, wherever you are, do you have this living hope? Do you have it? How do you get it? Well, he said it's implanted when you receive the new birth, how do you get and obtain the new birth? You can't do anything about that. It's the work of God. He said it's based upon his great mercy. But when and where does God most usually pour out his mercy for people to be born again? Through the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of Jesus, the sinner hears of the great mercy of God the power of God, the salvation of God in Jesus. And then by his mercy and by his power, he causes the sinner to see things they could not see before, to love things that they once had no taste for, to receive things that they once spent their life running from. And in that moment when the mercy of God comes and the power of God comes in the new birth, the person sees Christ. Christ is revealed to them as altogether lovely, altogether wonderful and glorious and irresistible. And that person cannot and will not leave that moment without him. This is what happens. Our hope is anchored in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Now, Peter has given us words of encouragement by the Holy Spirit. But those have just been, these encouragements we've already seen, they are just the first pearls on the necklace that he wants to show us. There's more. Next, I want you to see in verse 4, praise for the inheritance awaiting us. Look at verse 4. Verse 4. Anniversary, the hope uh, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. You see, what, what has God done for us in his mercy? He doesn't just allow us to give us a gift of living after we die. He promises an inheritance. There's something waiting for us. What's an inheritance? We, we, we know that. This is wealth passed down. 
This is riches that you did not accumulate. This is wealth obtained by another, something given to you. And what you're receiving in inheritance is completely undeserved, unearned, unmerited. It's freely given. Now I want you to think about this. We, we receive an inheritance, us, Who were we? We were the ones that have been found guilty in God's courtroom already. We're the ones who have our hands covered in blood. We're the ones who sin willfully and deserve hell. And yet it says we receive an inheritance. But Jesus, the beloved of the Father, he perfectly pleased God in every way on this earth. He resisted every temptation. He withstood every assault from Satan. He did not yield to sin once and he was victorious over it all. But he is the one that's punished for sin and he dies and God raises him from the dead and God crowns him with victory, crowns him with victory, and, and he, is a, he ascends into glory. He is seated at the right hand of God, and God rewards his son by giving him the kingdom. And yet it says, we sinners have received forgiveness. We've been made his children. We are now brothers and sisters of Christ. And it says, now we share in Jesus's inheritance. We do. We have become co-heirs with Christ. An heir is a recipient to an inheritance, a recipient to a throne. We share in his spoils. And, And this is saying the vilest of sinners, rebels against God, you and I, we shall reign with him. We shall reign with him. What does that wonderful song that we sing say? It says, why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. What's the writer saying there? Why should I gain? Why should I have a part in his inheritance? He has earned this. And yet it's given. And Peter says, praise be to God. Praise God. And he says he, uh, he, he, he wants to describe this inheritance. Words can't do it justice. So Peter just gives a little bit, but he gives a threefold description of it. Look at it in verse 4. Firstly, he says, we've been brought into an inheritance that can never perish. This world at the end will be destroyed by fire. It will perish. Our bodies are mortal. They will perish. Everything that has been created here has an expiry date. Everything. And yet he says, our inheritance, what is waiting for us, it is everlasting. It is eternity. It does not expire. It's permanent. And secondly, look how he describes it in verse 4. It will never spoil. Literally, it is undefiled. Which means no more sin. No more sin. When I read this and when I think about that, I look at this and I think it seems too good to be true. You're saying there will be no more sin. You're saying my sin will stop. My sin, there will be no more. How do I comprehend that? I'm so sick and tired of my sin and I get this glorious promise and I say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. It's too wonderful. But he says sin will not be allowed entrance. And we will not sin because when we see him, we will be made like him. And Jesus doesn't sin and neither will we. And Satan who tempted Christ, Satan who went into heaven and accused Job before God, Satan who tempts us when we come to church, Satan who tempts us when we're even praying to God, he's not allowed in. It'll be an undefiled inheritance. And see, thirdly, He describes it, it will never fade. Things in this life fade, they wither. 
They deteriorate, even the best of things. Our health withers, our abilities wither, our relationships wither, enjoyment in pleasure and pleasure wither. Even the, even the most rarest, most beautiful flower will see decay and wither. Time, time is our great enemy that never sleeps, never sleeps. But where we are going, the place that we are heading, time will no longer be against us in that place. Why? Because we step into eternity and things don't wither in eternity. There is no fading, there is no withering, just our joy will be there in our inheritance and it will never fade. So that's why Jesus says, he tells us in Matthew 6, don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Don't do that. It's all withering, it's all fading, but rather store up your treasures in heaven where they cannot be destroyed and where they cannot be stolen. Why is there so much panic today? Stock markets crashing, supers diminishing, businesses closing, all of it in this life can be taken away. There's panic here because our treasures have been stored on earth. But look at your inheritance. Look what it says at the end of verse 4. It can never perish, spoil or fade. And it's kept in heaven for you. It's kept in heaven for you. In Australia, just, re- just these last few months, the end of last year to this year, We have had drought, we have had bushfires, we have had flooding. Now we've got this coronavirus, this deadly virus. Peter says, your inheritance is kept in a place where none of these things can touch it. None of it. None of it can take it away. It's kept in heaven. And so this thing that we're we're heading towards, this inheritance, we don't need to scramble and push and shove to try and obtain it. Just like the shopping centers, people are are, are, are mad rushing pharmacies and all of these things pushing and scrambling. We don't need to do that for our inheritance. It's not necessary because it's being kept. Spurgeon said this. It was wonderful when I read it. Spurgeon said, quote, "There There is a place in heaven for me which none of you can fill. There is a crown which no head can wear except mine. And so will each of you. So with each of you. You see, when you get to heaven, on that day, when you get into your inheritance, when you walk in, you will see a table with your name reserved on it. The table will be reserved and you'll see your name at it. What's the best part of this inheritance though? What's the best part? For Israel, their inheritance was the land of Canaan. Was that it? For the church, is it just that we get to go to heaven, that there's no more sin and that we can live on forever? No, no, no. That's not the best part. The best part has always been the same thing. Psalm 16 verses 5 to 6 says this, Lord, you are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance See, he's not talking about sapphire skies or golden streets or a better body that we're going to get. Those things are all wonderful. But you get God. You get him. You get unbroken fellowship with him. You get to see him face to face and you get to enjoy him for all eternity. Church, look what, look what awaits us. Look what is being kept for us. What can man What can fires, what can a virus and plagues do to us? We should be able to say, in light of all this, with Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If God be for us, who can be against us? Church, There should not be, let there not be a shred of panic amongst us. The only thing befitting of our God is praise, Peter says. Praise. Blessing God. Well, there's one one last pearl I want you to see on this necklace that he has for us. Peter said we have received great mercy. We have been born again. He's given us a living hope and an inheritance reserved in heaven for us. Yet, what good is an inheritance 
What good is all of that if we do not have the strength to get to it? Think about Peter's readers. Peter, Peter, Peter's readers saying to Peter, Peter, it all sounds so wonderful. It all sounds so excellent that this is all waiting for us and it's being kept for us. But what happens if I can't make it? I mean, we're being persecuted. We're suffering. They're torturing our bodies. They're taking our homes. They're taking our families. We're suffering. We're like lambs to the slaughter. What if I can't identify with Christ? What if I can't stand before the machine gun and identify with Christ? What if I can't give up my ventilator? What if I can't stick it out to the end? Look what Peter says in verse 5. It's kept in heaven for you. You who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. The Holy Spirit says through Peter, you are shielded. You are shielded by God's power. Literally, that Greek word shielded there, it means kept under guard. You are in protective custody. Do you hear hear that, Christian? He's saying God has put you under arrest. What better custody to be in than God Almighty? He's kept you under his arrest. And and do you see the double blessing here? What's the double blessing? The double blessing is the double keeping that we get promised here. Your inheritance is kept reserved for you, secure. And you too are being kept secure by the power of God. By his power, he will keep you. You could translate verse and, verses 4 and 5 like this. Your inheritance is being kept in heaven for you, and you are being kept for it. And this is exactly what Jesus taught. No one will snatch you from my hand. No one will snatch you from my Father's hand. I will keep you from wandering back into this world and deserting me, and I will keep you from the evil one. The the imagery here is God has walled you in his city. So even if all the armies of the world were to come and stand against you, even if all the beasts of hell were to rage against you, even if Satan was to unleash all of his firepower against you, those walls are not coming down. Jericho's walls fell down, but God's walls surrounding you will not. They will not. You're shielded by his power. How does God display this power to us? How is it conferred to us? How does he administer this power? He says, you who through faith are shielded by his power. What's he saying here? God continually fuels your faith. He continually energizes it so that no matter what you face, what's the power of God upon you, walling you in? He will not let your faith crumble. He will keep you holding on to him. He will not let you turn away. He he empowers your faith. You who are going through trials and troubles already, if you're still trusting in Jesus in this moment, it is a testament that his power is shielding you. It empowers your faith. And how long will his power be keeping you? How long will his keeping power be upon you? He says in verse 5, until the coming salvation that is ready to be revealed at the last time. What's the coming salvation at the last time? I thought I'm saved already now. Yes, you are saved in God's sight. And you're not going anywhere, but your full and final salvation when you enter in, happens at the last time. What's that referring to? Jesus' return. Jesus' return. And in that verse, the key word is ready. Do you see that? Ready, verse 5. It is ready to be revealed. Do you see that? The date is locked in. Your name is in the book of life. All preparations have been made. Jesus said it is finished. Everything is ready for him to come back and return. Do you see how glorious this living hope is? See, our hope is sure because of what happened in the past. Jesus rose again, Peter says. Our hope is sure in the future because Peter says he's coming back again. And our hope is sure even in the present crisis because Peter says you're shielded by his power. What a hope that we have. This is the living hope. 
Let me close. It all comes back to Peter's words, doesn't it? How he opened. He said, praise. Praise be to God. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for his great mercy. For his great mercy, not a small cup. You must picture this as extravagant, a boundless and vast river is his mercy. And so I ask you, sinner, with all of your filth, with all of your sin, with all of your guilt, have you gone into that river and washed? Because everyone who goes into that river, they come out as white as snow. The dead are carried into that river and they come out living. They're made alive. This is his great mercy. I trust, I trust this morning that God's word has been applied to you by the Holy Spirit like a skilled surgeon. That he is cut off, that he is removed and he's taken out what he's needed to and he's sewn you up and he's given health to your body and he's strengthened and encouraged you, church. Now, this, this, this time, this is not the time for fear and panic. In crisis, Peter says, in crisis, this is the perfect time for praise. This is the perfect time for praising God. I trust this has been helpful. An email has been sent out to you with two links. Uh, they are two songs that I've attached that I think are fitting uh, for what we have considered uh, this morning and I trust that as you sing them with your family or whether you're by yourself that they will be an encouragement to you now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all amen God bless you church